will, turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And as you're turning there, I'm going to ask you to do two things at once. Turn there and get this sheet out. As uh, we talk about our month of missions for just a moment, uh, this month we're focusing on some of the mission uh, involvement of the church. Each week we're looking at some local things, some global things. And you can see here at the top, the CARES Apartment Ministry. This is a new ministry that's getting involved, getting established here in um, Orlando. And, uh, you know, there are two areas of, in, in the United States that uh, pockets of, of people that are highly unchurched. One of that's the special needs community. Highly unchurched because very few people do anything for that. But then secondly, it's multifamily housing apartment because it's a little bit more transitional. This is a new ministry that allows us to take some of our members and they move into an apartment complex and really become a combination of the apartment chaplains, the apartment welcome wagon and activities director. And so we've already, uh, we have our couple, Tyler and Heather Nickel, they've gone through training, they've been approved and they should be placed in an apartment complex here within the next couple of weeks. And so we wanted you to be aware about, of that. You can go on the website, take a look at more of that. Then the Bethany Christian Service. This month is, uh, is the adoption month. It's a month focused on adoption. And so we are focusing on some of those. And some of y'all, we all know Don and B, and they adopted Joanna May through Bethany Christian Services. They've got a table set up outside right after the service. If you go out to the foyer, you can learn more about them and what they're doing. Also, we don't have, it's on the back. If you look under the Wilbur Group, the second one listed under the small group, you'll see it's Edgewood Children's Ranch. They've got a display out here. It's a great ministry here in town. And um, I think we have some ladies here from Edgewood. Are you, are, do we have some ladies here from Edgewood? Stand, please. Our ladies from Edgewood. We want to just welcome y'all. And All right. Awesome. <laughs> go by their table. There's many ways you can get involved. You can connect with the Wilbur Group when they go and, and uh, go to the ranch. Or they have a wish list of things out there that they need. You can go pick that up. And then each week we do a global focus. Last week it was Burundi, and this morning at the uh, 9.30 hour we had one of the pastors who's a friend of ours from Burundi who was here in Orlando for a conference. He was in our service. But today we're talking about Brazil. 2012, the world is coming to Brazil or going to Brazil because the World Cup will be in Brazil. And the church in Brazil sees a great opportunity to touch the world through that. And so as a church, since... Are, you know, what y'all may not know this, but Azaleo is not from southern Georgia. He is from <laughs> Brazil. And so we've got a connection there, and uh, we're going to be doing things in Brazil and uh, working with churches there and helping to strengthen those churches. And uh, Donnie, stand up. Donnie, several months ago, went on a trip to Brazil that was one of those 10 day trips that we take. And while he was there, God got a hold of his heart and called him back. And Donnie just got home from three months in Brazil, continuing with the mission project there. He's getting fluent in Portuguese. And, uh, and here's a little side note, just to let you know. While he was there, I think he met a lady friend. Is that right? All right. So, yeah. So, Lord had a double plan for that one, right? So, Donnie, it's good to have you back. I, uh, we started a new sermon series last week called Stress of the Season. And uh, we all admit that this time of year, the stress level is turned up a notch as we go into the Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and all of those kind of things. In fact, last week we kind of identified five different areas where our stress can go up because of these five things. First of all, you're going to experience family stress. And that's because everybody in your family has a different vision of what a great holiday looks like, right? Uh, for, for Thanksgiving, maybe it's, you know, the teenager, I get to sleep in until 12 and then play video games and, and all that. For mom, it's we're going to sit around the big table 
We're going to be there for hours. We're going to get lost in conversation. And uh, it's just going to be so great. And there's not going to be any technology on at all at that time. And we're going to join hands and sing Kumbaya. It's going to be this. And Dad is saying, get the food on the table so I can get a plate and go sit in front of the flat screen for the games, right? So he's going to bring tension because everybody has a different vision of what a great holiday season looks like. Uh, not only are you going to deal with family stress, you're going to deal with shopping stress. Uh, who do you buy gifts for and how much do you spend and what's our budget, which leads to the third, and that's financial stress. We will spend a lot more money these next couple of months on a big meal, on travel, on all the gifts and decorations and everything that we do, which leads, uh, which lastly, uh, put down, or fourthly, travel stress. You know, what do you do this holiday? Do you travel to the in-laws or the outlaws? Or do people come see you? And is the guest room ready? And do you fly? Do you drive? All of those kind of things. And then there is the one I'm going to struggle with, and that is the Beltline stress, right? Every place you go, food and good food and all the, the parties and everything. And so how do you maintain your weight and all of this kind of stuff? So all of those stresses. And our goal through this series is is to kind of talk about those and maybe when we hit all of that season this year we won't be quite as stressed out and here's what we also recognize that stress enhances some areas in life that we already struggle with last week we looked at the issue of anger and if you've got issues with anger add stress to that and the anger issues really come out Today, we're looking at the one that I struggle with, and I'm, I'm just confessing my sin right now, and that is the issue of control, okay? I am a control freak, and I am working on it. I'm in therapy. I'm really trying to get better at this. But my guess is many of you are control freaks too, so here's what we're going to do. If you know a control freak, raise your hand. If you know a control freak, all right? Now, the second question is a little bit harder. Be honest. If you would say, I am a control freak, raise your hand. All right, I'm happy for that. Now, if you are such a control freak that you raise the person's hand next to you, raise your hand. <laughs> right? We actually did at Lakeside. I said, are you a control freak? And one guy grabbed his wife's hand and stuck it up, okay? Here's some signs that you may be a control freak. You're the only one who can do it right, okay? Uh, you're a control freak if you're always telling other people what they should be doing. You're a control freak. You're a control freak if you get, you know, if you uh, 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 get the shakes if somebody else is holding the TV remote. That's a sign you're a control freak. You're a control freak if you control your spouse's schedule and spending. You know, they hadn't seen the checkbook in months because you control that, don't want them to see it. You're a control freak if you are controlling every aspect of your child's life and they're 28. And you know that you're a control freak, okay? And here's the deal. This is one of those, those sins and those character flaws that, that we cover up in many different ways. And here's how we do it. I'm not a control freak. I'm just a type A personality, right? We say things like that, or I'm not a control freak, I'm just well organized. No, you're a control freak, and let's call it what it is, and here's what we need to see. Just like anger, being a control freak can be destructive to you and to those around you. We're going to look at a snapshot of King David's life when he was a control freak, and we're going to see why he wanted to be a control freak and, and then what to do about it. I ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel 12, but the story starts in 11, and we don't have time to read it, so let me, just, let me just share with you 11, and we'll get to 12 in just a minute. Chapter 11 starts in verse 1 and says this, at a time when kings go to war. Who's the king? It's David. And, and it says, at a time when kings go to war... David stayed home. Now, some commentaries kind of argue about this, but I believe David should have been, I believe that that's in there to say David should have been someplace else. And you know what? We always get in trouble when we're not where we're supposed to be. 
But David is back at the palace. He has sent Joab to lead the, the army and go to war. And David decides one afternoon to take a stroll up on the roof. And while he's up there, he looks, and there across the street is this hot babe Bathsheba taking a uh, bath. And David gets uh, uh, decides he's, he wants uh, Bathsheba, and so he goes in and he says, who's that lady across the street? And I love their answer. Their answer is this. That is Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. But that didn't dissuade David. David said, go get her for me. And being the king, he had all power. And they did. And they brought Bathsheba over. And David slept with Bathsheba and sent her home. And David thought, okay, that was a good afternoon. And he thought that was behind him until he gets word that Bathsheba is pregnant. And now comes fear because how is David going to cover that up and how is he going to control the issue so when David gets word that Bathsheba is pregnant he goes into full damage control mode and this is what he determines to do he says you know what I'm going to bring Uriah home and get him to sleep with Bathsheba and then that way he'll think that's his child so he calls to the front line, and he says, for Uriah to come, come home under the pretense to get an update from what's going on at the front. So Uriah comes home, and, and David said, tell me about Joab. How's he doing? How's everything going? You got everything you need, all the supplies? Okay, great. I'll tell you what, Joe, Uriah, why don't you just go home, chill for the night, you go back to the front lines tomorrow. David gets word that Joab didn't go home that he slept at uh, the entrance to the palace. And David calls him in and said, why in the world didn't you go home? And Uriah said, sir, my master Joab is out fighting and, and my friends are out there fighting and, and we're in the middle of a war. How can I go home and enjoy the luxuries of home when everybody else is on the front? And David's still trying to control it, and he says, okay, if I can't do it that way, I'll do it this way. So, so David determined, I'm going to get Uriah drunk. And if I get him drunk, surely he's going to go home and want to sleep with Bathsheba. So he gets him drunk, and yet the Bible says Uriah didn't make it home. He stopped on a mat and fell asleep and slept it off. And the next day, David calls him in, and he gets word that Uriah once again didn't go home. David's done everything he can to try to do damage control that way, but that's not work. So David comes up with another plan. And so he writes a letter to Joab, and he has it sealed, and he asks Uriah to deliver it. And the contents of the letter are this. The contents of the letter say this. Joab, next time you're in a heated battle, put, put Uriah all the way up in the front. And when the fighting gets the fiercest, withdraw everybody except Uriah. And so without knowing it, Uriah is basically carrying his own death sentence with him back and giving it to Joab. Because here's how David's going to control it now. If I can't get him to sleep with his wife Bathsheba, I'll just make, him, make sure that he dies in war. Bathsheba becomes a uh, widow and then I swoop in as the hero and take her under my wing and she becomes one of my wives and he's doing all of that because of fear of being found out and here's what we need to understand control can be incredibly destructive when we try to control all of the situations around us in your notes what is the root cause of our desire to control? It's fear. David said, fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. David was afraid he was going to get caught, so he tried to control everything and, and to get himself out of trouble. And let me say this. There are people in this worship center this weekend that are seized with fear. You're afraid of being found out about something, so you're doing everything you can to control that. And you make sure everything has a password, or you make sure that everything is deleted, or you make sure, and, and you're doing everything you can 
to control it because you're afraid of being found out. There are others in here, you're afraid of your health. And you're afraid of what the doctor might tell you. So the way you control that is you're just not going to go to the doctor. Because if you don't go, then you won't know. And that's how you're controlling the issue. And we've seen over the years people who had something very minor, if they would have dealt with it and up front, it wouldn't have become major. But we're afraid, and so we're going to control it by just not even going to the doctor. Others in here, you're afraid that your marriage isn't going to make it. So you're trying to control your spouse and control all the situations around it. Some, you're afraid your kids are going in the wrong direction. So you're trying to control every aspect of their life. Last night, somebody came up to me and said, I have a 16-year-old. I believe he's going in the wrong direction. And we've been trying to control everything, who he can see, who he can talk to, where he can go, when he can go, all of those kind of things. And I had to lovingly say, that can be destructive if not handled in the right way. And so we've got this fear issue that causes us to try to control, and we just keep saying, man, we can fix it if we can control it. And the truth is, this issue of control is huge in our culture. Amazon.com, I went on Amazon.com, hundreds of titles of books with control in it. How to control your mind, how to control your anger, how to do damage control, how to control your time, how to control your kids, how to control your life, how to control your destiny, how to control your cholesterol. I love this one, how to control the classroom, obviously for a substitute teacher, right? And, and there's all kinds of books on how to be in control. And I want to say to you, that this weekend, in this message, we're going in an opposite direction. This message isn't five steps on how to be in control and how to control, but this message is about how to lose control. You see, this issue of control, it's one of those paradoxes that the Bible teaches. You know about those. The Bible says, if you want to live, you must die says if you want to be first, you must be last. If you want to be the greatest, then you must become the least. So how do we deal with control? The issue is we lose control. Because let's get real, there is very little you have control over anywhere. You have an illusion of control over a lot of things. But the truth is you have very, very little you actually have control over. You can eat all the right food, keep your stress level down, exercise four times a week, and still die of a heart attack before this service is over. You can do all, everything right and still be diagnosed with a malignant tumor tomorrow. You have no control over that. We are to manage our health, and hopefully we are eating right, and hopefully we are exercising, and and keeping stress level down, but ultimately we don't have any control over that. You, you don't have any control over the weather. It can rain on your parade. There are a whole bunch of kids on the Northeast this year who couldn't have trunk or treat. I mean, <laughs> trunk or treat, listen to me, I'm so, <laughs> trick or treat. They couldn't go out, why? Their Halloween was canceled because of a huge snowstorm. You can't control those. You can't control your spouse. You think you can. But ultimately, all you're doing is making both of you miserable. You can be the best driver in the world, follow all of the, the, the laws and rules, be very cautious, and a drunk can still get on the road, cross over line, hit you head on, and you have no control over that. And so the Bible says, you want to know how to deal with this sin of control? Lose control. Let me explain what I mean. In our notes, let's look how to lose control. There's three things you're going to have to surrender. That the Bible teaches us if you want to live in peace with joy and, and, and overcome this issue of control, three things you need to surrender. Number one, you need to surrender your fears to God. Surrender your fears to God. Three fears I want to talk about. First of all, surrender your fear of rejection. 
everybody wants to be liked, everybody wants to be loved, and so we try to control our image all the time. We try to control what people think about us by the way that we dress, by the, the cars that we drive, by the way that we talk. And, and so we're so afraid if people knew certain things about us that they would reject us and they wouldn't love us. And so we do all we can to control our image, even if that means exaggerating on things and flat out lying. Because that fear drives us to control. And here's what scripture says, God made us all unique and we're different. And the truth is we are all dysfunctional in different areas. I'm the only normal person I know. And you know what? You're the only normal person you know, right? And, and instead of doing that, we just need to be who we are and not worry as long as, as long as Jesus loves me as long as God loves me, as long as my wife puts up with him, my kid, that's okay, that's enough. And we need to let control of this whole, lose control of this whole issue of the fear of being rejected. We need to secondly give up the fear of failure. Give up trying to control everything because of the fear of failure. So many men, their, their whole being is tied up into their job that they put that above everything else because they figure if I can control the work, I can control the income, I can control what people think about me, I, I can control everything and I do that through my job because if I fail at my job, I will feel like a complete failure in every area of my life. This whole fear of failure drives people to live in ways that really aren't them. Over the years, I've met and talked to and know many people who are living their lives because they don't want for their parents to think that they're a failure and they're living for their parents' approval. And here's the deal. Some of them, their parents have been dead for 30 years. But they're so afraid of rejection that they're still living for their parents' approval. need to let go of that fear of failure. And then lastly, the fear of the unknown. And this drives so many to try to control this whole fear of the unknown. When there are things you don't know how it's going to turn out, you try to manipulate or control every situation. You know, God may be calling you to do something. And, and you have all of these fears. Man, you are afraid afraid of rejection, that you're not going to be able to do it, that you're going to fail, and, and you don't know what the outcome is going to be, and so you've said no to God over and over to control that situation because you have this fear of the unknown. Well, that's what's going on with David here. He has this fear of the unknown. He has sinned, and he's trying to cover it up. So let me ask you the question here. What fear do you need to surrender? And here's the thing. Some of you can't write it down right now because you're afraid of what your spouse is going to think when you write that down. And that's how pervasive this issue of control and, and, and how fear plays into that. Well, like I said, David was afraid he was going to be found out, so he got in control of the situation, did damage control, and he thought he was out of the woods. Uriah was killed in battle. He was able to take Bathsheba as, wife, as his wife, and he thought everything is great, except we can never keep it from God. And God is going to expose his sin. And let me tell you, those areas you're trying to control, God will expose that, and let me tell you why. Because he loves you too much to let you live that way for too long. Eventually, it's going to be exposed. And so God loves you too much for you to be in that. And he loved David so much, he's going to confront his sin. In fact, after this confrontation, we're going to see David as a changed man. And David's going to, going to have this incredible psalm of, uh, of calling out to God and confessing his sin and forgiving. And God calls David a man after his own heart. 
but he's going to confront David, and he's going to do it through the prophet, prophet Nathan. He's going to send Nathan to David to confront David with his sin. And i got to tell you, if I was Nathan, I would have tried to control that situation. I would have said, God, you know, you could send an angel. David can't mess with him. Just send an angel or, or send somebody else. Because here's what Nathan knew. You did not go and give the king bad news and expect to walk away unscathed. This isn't like going to the president. And how many would be nervous going and telling the president he's wrong? This is like going to a third world dictator with an attitude and a quick trigger finger. And yet Nathan doesn't try to control it. He just obeys. Why? Because he's lost control. He's given it up and not trying to control the situation. So we pick up in chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, and the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Now notice this next line. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. God exposed David's sin. David went on to understand that, that what Nathan was saying was Uriah had one wife that he loved, and you have all the kingdom, and you took the one thing that Uriah loved the most, his wife, and then you took his, then you took his life. And so his sin has been exposed, and yet he tried to control it because of the fear of being found out. And let me say this. You might be able to hide something from others around you for a period of time, but you can never hide it from God. And how do we release that, that fear? Well, the next two will lead us to that. Number two, surrender the details. Not only do we surrender the fear, but we surrender the details. Look at Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Scripture says you don't have to worry about the details. Let God lead you, and he will reveal the details to you. Go on to Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. That word for God there, most high, is the word El Elyon, and it means the most high God, and it's defined this way, the God who is in control. And here's what the psalmist is saying, is that if we dwell in the thought and the understanding that God is totally sovereign, he's not asleep at the wheel, he's in charge of the visible and the invisible, then we can rest in him. If he calls us to do something, he will provide the details at the right time. So what details do we need to surrender? Honestly, I don't think I need to pray about whether I'm going to wear a, blue, I mean, a brown belt or a black belt today. I don't think I need to pray about whether short sleeves or long sleeves. I don't think I need to pray tonight is it Chinese or Italian. I don't think I have to pray about every detail, but what details do I need to pray about? Here would be a good guide. If it's big enough to stress over, and if it's big enough to try to control it, it's big enough to pray over. And it's big enough to wait for God to give me direction. So you get a job offer. Don't stress over it, pray. God has a plan. He's got a design for your life. You don't make a decision based on a paycheck. You make a decision based on God's sovereign plan and will for your life. 
but we want to try to control it. So we call everybody we know who has connections, and we say, could you put in a good word, and, and all of those kind of things, and many times trying to control it when what it is, it's totally outside of God's plan and desire for our lives. So we surrender the details to him, and it's only when we recognize that he's sovereign, that he's in control, that he has a plan, and we release the details that we can overcome this deadly desire to control everything. So we surrender our fears, we surrender the details, and then thirdly, we surrender our lives. Surrender your life. Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. When we talk about being a fully devoted follower of Christ, we talk about somebody who every day is saying, God, you are in control, and because you're in control, I'm not. Teach me to follow you today. Ultimately, that's what becoming a Christian is all about. What is salvation? Salvation is nothing more than giving up control. Salvation is saying, God, when I'm in control, it's a mess. And God, there are times when I'm in control, there's this illusion that things are going good, but ultimately it's a mess. So God, I give up control, and I ask you to come in and take control and lead me. And that's what salvation is all about. And when we give up control, then we don't have to worry about the details because God is working all things out for our good. When we give up control, we don't have to fear because he is bigger than any issue we will ever face. So how do we deal with control? Well, we lose control by surrendering it all to Christ. Let's pray together.